Welcome to the Rights Track Podcast, where we aim to get the hard facts about the human rights challenges facing us today. Over the last two series, we've been talking to human rights academics and practitioners about research, impact, and advocacy in the struggle for human rights. In this series, we turn our attention to the struggle to end modern slavery. I'm Todd Landman. In today's episode of The Rights Track, we're discussing how local research and outreach can make a city slavery-free. My guest is Dr. Allison Gardner. Allison built her career in local government and has experience in policymaking and governance. In 2016, she finished her PhD on the responses to austerity in English local governance. She's now head of the Slavery-Free Communities Program within the Rights Lab, a multi-million pound project at the University of Nottingham focused on ending modern slavery. So welcome, Alison. It's great to have you here on this episode of The Rights Track. Thank you very much. Great to be here. So what does it mean to have a slavery-free community? Part of the process of what we're doing is working out the answer to that question. So if we think about the way that policy, anti-slavery policy, has developed in the UK to date, what we've had is a lot of focus on national level politics. So we had the Modern Slavery Act in 2015. We've had a good deal of funding that's gone into national level enforcement. And there's been a lot of focus on raising awareness, on ensuring that the media are picking up stories around anti-slavery. But what we haven't actually seen is very much attention to how policy is implemented at a local level. And that's a real problem because slavery is primarily first encountered at the local level. Um, It's prevented at the local level, potentially, Mm. as well, through the actions of of local agencies, through making communities aware of what it looks like. So you have prevention, you have discovery. In terms of recovery of victims, that's also managed often by local level services and local voluntary sector services. And thinking about beyond recovery, you want to create communities that are really resilient against this. So I think that's a gap in in the way that our current policy has been developed. So slavery-free communities is really working out how we fill that gap and how we actually respond to modern slavery using the services that we have, using the the resources that we have on the ground, because we're in a kind of uh, post-financial crisis, post-austerity environment, Um, and looking towards the future of how can we serve people better to ensure that slavery cannot flourish in the places in which we live. So it's an eradication strategy, but it's also a prevention strategy, because what you try to do is get rid of slavery in the first case, in the first instance, but also prevent it from returning at all. Yeah, absolutely. And right. a number of the, the NGOs who are active in this, they talk about this kind of sy- systemic view of slavery and tackling slavery that runs from prevention through discovery and recovery, and then thinking about what you do beyond recovery in order to ensure that it doesn't come back. And I think that's actually quite a useful way of thinking about the range of responses that we need to put in place in order to make our communities slavery free. So is there a possibility for someone who has freed from slavery to go right back into it in the sense that you can kind of have a short term rescue mission, uh, but if procedures and policies and recuperative strategies are not in place, that person could be drawn right back into the problem? Absolutely. And unfortunately, within the UK context, there, there is a fear that that is a real problem. But what we don't have at the moment is the data on how often that is happening, because currently there is no systematic tracking of people who are coming out of the government support service, the national referral mechanism, and, and what their outcomes are after that. What we know anecdotally is that they often have trouble um, accessing housing, accessing basic benefits. So what we're often finding is that people, if they get their rescue from slavery, even if they go through the national referral mechanism process, they get their 45 days of support. That can end. They can have agreement from the government that they've been victims of slavery, but they actually go, go off what's described as a cliff edge and are left destitute in many cases. Um, And at the moment, NGOs are picking up some of the burden of that. Local voluntary and community sector organisations are picking up some of the burden of that. But there's no systematic attention to how that problem is fixed on the ground. There are... There are discussions about how it might be fixed on the ground and the government's made some recent (laughs) announcements about extending NRM provision potentially, extending some pilots to look at the way that people are supported in communities, but that is not extended across the country currently. 
Amazing. And, and just for clarity's sake, it's not necessarily that people from the UK have not been involved in slavery, which is to say you can get UK nationals who have also been. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And, and that is an issue as well. Uh, obviously, you know, in terms of UK nationals, they are a significant group in those who have been discovered and uh, who are also referred into the national referral mechanism process. But again, often there were conditions of vulnerability which took them into the situations of slavery in the first place. And those conditions that, uh, that cause that vulnerability, such as, for instance, substance abuse, such as homelessness, such as people who are otherwise indebted or in poverty, they're not always lifted in order to ensure that they, those people do not end up going back into situations of re-exploitation. But do they have better access to benefits and care because they are UK nationals? I mean, this is kind of a, a popular problem because of the discussions around Brexit, who belongs, who doesn't, who has access, who doesn't. So do UK nationals in any sense have a better hope of a chance of getting out of slavery or is that just a naive view? Well, we don't have any evidence around that at the moment. And given some of the welfare reforms that we've seen taking place over the, since 2010, and particularly some of the, the welfare reforms that have taken place since 2013, if you have people who have been through psychological trauma, who are unable to work, um, yes, they will have access into certain benefits, such as our health system, which some people would not necessarily be entitled to. Um, but are there really good support services in place for those people? Not always, and not in all situations. And, yeah. and we know that services are at full stretch in, in regards to looking after people. And we know that issues like benefits, sanctions, mean that people are often left in, in conditions of extreme poverty these days. Yeah, so you opened up by talking about the kind of holistic nature of the problem. So could you talk us through who are the key stakeholders involved in this? Because it sounds like it's quite multi-sectoral. And then I'm curious about the intersectionality of all of these things. So, and, and the coordination challenge, because if you're involving all these different stakeholders, how does everybody know what everybody's doing in this problem area? Well, this is one of the real challenges around this area. I mean, the people who have taken primary responsibility today are the police. And the police have certainly had some direction around this agenda. There were recently a number of detailed inspection reports published by the Her Majesty's Inspector at the Constabulary in relation to police responses in this area. So the police have taken the lead, but they themselves recognise that actually they are not necessarily the best agency to be in the lead on this agenda because it's something in which we need to engage with the community, it's something in which we need to engage as well with other local statutory services such as health services, such as local authorities. The other kind of main body of organisations that can have a huge amount to contribute to this agenda but hasn't really been tapped into as much as it could be to date are local voluntary and community sector organisations. So at the moment, in terms of the government strategy around this agenda, it has produced the, the National Referral Mechanism, which is run by the Salvation Army, and under the Salvation Army's contract, it subcontracts to a number of other NGOs. So it's not a government body, it's actually an NGO that's doing this work. It's an NGO that runs the, the National Referral Mechanism, but very much under contract, right. so commissioned to okay. do that. But the NGOs that work with the Salvation Army tend to be sort of regional and national in themselves, and the engagement with the local voluntary and community sector, who've often been working in specific localities with specific groups of people that are relevant to this problem for quite some time. It's been very limited. And there's one further group as well that I'd say that are incredibly underrepresented in work at the moment, and that's the community at large. And over the last few years, what we've seen in public services is a much stronger trend towards co-production of services in conjunction with local people and local communities. So much less about you being somebody who receives services from the state, but actually we're moving into a situation whereby you are somebody who um, uh, works with the state in order to help produce the kinds of um, services and changes that are needed on the ground. We really haven't seen a great engagement with that within the context of local anti-slavery policy at the moment and I think that's an area that could be developed hugely 
um, in the next few years. And there are organisations that are starting to lead initiatives in that agenda, and one such is the Church of England, which has just recently launched something called the Clure Initiative, which is about mobilising local faith communities. But they're early steps and kind of understanding where and how the communities can make a difference. That's a, that's at a kind of formative stage at present. I'm always struck that, you know, a serious public policy problem ends up having a non-governmental solution in that sense, which is a, an unusual way to plug a gap where there's not the kind of resource from government to, to handle these problems. So I guess we could turn our attention then to Nottingham. So you're working in Nottingham. Your target is to make Nottingham a, a slavery-free city, uh, perhaps the first in the UK, uh, and then the lessons learned from what you do here in Nottingham could, could transfer to other cities. So talk us a little bit through the situation in the context here in Nottingham. So presumably this is predicated on the fact that there are slaves in Nottingham and that we might even know where some of them are. Uh, so how does one begin this kind of work? We have some basic tenets of what a slavery-free communities program might look like, which are built on Kevin Bales's book, The Slave Next Door. And he argued that within uh, a slavery-free city, you might well have public awareness raising, you might have training of frontline staff, you're likely to have strong victim support services, you're likely to have engagement with law enforcement. If you want good, strong, sustainable local services, then you obviously have to have a mandate for providing those and you have to have local civic leaders on board who are willing to resource that. We also need to raise public awareness. We need to train the frontline staff who are out there engaging with the public all the time. And that's not just necessarily in public and state provided services. Again, it can be with NGOs, but it can also be with businesses, for instance, who are often engaging with, with people in their homes. So a good example of a, a company we quite like to work with in Nottingham is E.ON. Um, right. Because E.ON have a lot of meter readers that go around to all kinds of different houses. And are not this is the electrical and company. To people's right. houses. Yeah. 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 And we had some of their employees come along to an event of ours and they said, um, they said well, E.ON would be a fantastic organisation because we're seeing all these people all the time. Um, that we're walking in and out of houses. We could potentially train our meter readers to spot the lines of slavery. So that's the kind of ways that you can work with different organisations in order to start to make your community slavery free. I, th I think that, you know, in addition to the awareness raising, training of frontline staff, we're quite interested in the idea of how you make a slavery free economy. And so that would be about trying to encourage the types of businesses and business practices that would strengthen the community against slavery. And that is quite a new and different area as well, because it requires businesses to look beyond the supply chains legislation that's in Section 54 of the Modern Slavery Act, and actually to think about what their role is as employers within a community, as, as kind of um, citizens of that community, corporate citizens of that community. And then there's the issue of stronger survivor support services. We're working locally with the Red Cross, who have a fantastic um, service called your space, which they use to help plug the gap that currently exists between when a survivor comes forward and when they're allowed to enter the NRM, which can be up to five days. They're helping us with that gap, gap at the moment, but there's a lot more that we could do around improving the existing support services that are available for survivors. Um, and then there's the whole issue of sharing intelligence between agencies. Right. And again, that could be strengthened in many ways. So one of the things we started looking into is, is how we can work more closely with the banks to use information that they have around potential activities that might be happening in the area um, to liaise with police so that we have a better understanding and mapping of where the potential for slavery is. So I was going to ask you about banks. I was thinking about banks. I was thinking about hospitals. So what would banks be looking out for? Well, in the case of banks, they would potentially be looking out for suspicious transactions or suspicious ways of using accounts. So the classic thing with, with banks is that when people are perhaps trafficked into the country or picked up by slaveholders what they first do is they ensure that those people are claiming benefits and then they take the benefits off them. So one of the transactions that might occur is that a benefits payment comes into somebody's account, but it's immediately transferred off somewhere else. 
Or maybe they would use that person's withdrawal card to extract that benefits payment very soon after it's paid in. The mm. whole thing would be taken out and taken by somebody. And so one of the ways that um, a bank had been able to pick somebody up who was a slaveholder was they found some CCTV footage of, of somebody effectively feeding you know, multiple cards into a machine, extracting money, and then um, walking away with what was clearly other people's payments. Um, so that's an example of... of what the banks might be looking out for. And once you map that kind of data, once you start to be able to map some of that data with other data that might be useful to you, for instance, housing data. So in, in Nottingham, we have a really strong regime around houses and multiple occupation because the council has a licensing regime. So they understand where those houses are and you know they have them they have them mapped. What you can do if you you're able to look at maybe clusters of suspicious activity from a financial point of view, and HMOs, houses of multiple occupation, and potentially things like antisocial behaviour complaints. So, for instance, those might come up if people are putting out too much rubbish or if a house is particularly noisy because people are coming and going, many people are coming and going at all that at different hours of the day and night. You can start to piece together what might be the elements of um, a situation that could point towards modern slavery. Amazing. And then within, within the health sector, are nurses aware of this? Are they trained? Well, some training has been going on, and I know that um, in terms of safeguarding training within the NHS, modern slavery is currently picked up by our local NHS. But I think it's fair to say that there's still a lot of room for working with, with those who are at the front line, and particularly in situations like accident and emergency, where it's likely that anybody who's hurt and injured, uh, who's coming from a situation from exploitation, might be walking in and actually accessing services. It's really important that those staff are trained up, but of course what we have in the NHS is, is again, staff shortages, staff churn, um, an enormous number of people coming in from agencies. Uh, so actually they've got a, quite an uphill struggle. And in terms of a lot of this work, it has to be ongoing. It can't be a one-off. Yeah. It has to be a drip, drip, drip of this is what the message is about until actually everybody's level of consciousness around it is raised so high that the signs start to stand out to people. And I think we've made that journey over the last few years with, with other types of problems. And I'm, I'm quite interested in the idea of whether there's something you could do in terms of behavioural economics around raising awareness on modern slavery. So, so the whole idea around nudge, yeah. yeah. Um, and the nudge behind tobacco control being the smoking ban in public places. Right. Or, or if you look at the way that, um, for instance, drink driving's become unacceptable over yeah. the last 30 years or so. You know, maybe there are ways in which we could use those kinds of techniques to actually just raise people's consciousness of modern slavery to such a level that actually it would be much more obvious to people what they're seeing and they'd be able to pick up those signs and report them more quickly. Yes, and in that way, that raised consciousness can be the preventative side of things as well, because people would no longer tolerate these activities, they would seek out alternative ways of doing things, etc. So I wonder, just in the, the few minutes we have left, if you could tell us a little bit about this more salient case uh, that came to our attention in, in Lincoln. So I understand that in Lincoln, there was a traveler community that was uh, tried and convicted for, for having engaged in, in slaveholding behavior. Talk us through just the some of the particulars of that. And, and what's the result? Is the result a conviction? Are, are, did people go to prison for this? Uh, what, what are the sanctions out there at the moment in the legal system? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're referring to the Rooney case, which was recently tried at Nottingham County Court. And this was a particularly shocking story where multiple victims had been picked up, in, in most cases, UK nationals, but they'd been picked off of, of soup runs, out of homelessness uh, hostels, uh, you know, from outside food banks. So they were already in situations of vulnerability. And they were uh, picked up with the promise of a job, some accommodation, a little bit of security. In some cases, they were people as well who already had substance abuse problems, so they were picked up with the offer of a drink. Right. You know, we'll, we'll give you a drink, come in the van, you know, um, we'll give you a job. So in this case, multiple victims were taken, as I understand it, to um, several sites, uh, one of which was in Nottinghamshire. There were, there were others around as the country as well. Lincolnshire, I think, was another. And they, they were particularly involved in things like block paving work. 
but were, were kept under control, in some cases for many years. So they're out in the open working, they're doing block pavings, they're doing driveways, crazy paving, all that kind of stuff. Clients are paying the slave owner to have a job done. Yeah. They're cited a price. The client, let's say a family home of four bedrooms, a nice detached house somewhere gets a new driveway, they're none the wiser, but the actual people who come and do that work aren't getting paid and are not free to leave the condition of the work because they're indentured to whoever's organized this. That's yeah. that's basically how it works. That's basically how it works. Yeah. And, and you know, in terms of the, the recompense that they receive, they, they get food, they, they probably get something to feed any, any addictions or substance abuse that they have, which is part of the control mechanism. But yes, that was basically the situation. So these people were in contact with other members of the public, probably day in, day out in many cases. But as you say, they were completely controlled and that situation was sustained for, for a long time. In terms of the prison sentences, and you asked about that, I think in the, the Rooney conviction, there were some quite long prison sentences right. given out. We are seeing sentences increase overall. Right. Um, as the judiciary become more aware of these, this particular crime and of their responsibilities and, and uh, ways of dealing with it, um, we're starting to see sentences go up. But previously, there have been problems with sentences not being long enough. So is this in the uh, existing criminal code, or is this something that was uh, sort of enhanced with the, the Modern Slavery Act, or both? I think it was enhanced with right. the, the Modern Slavery Act in that there, there has been a, a, a kind of a stronger definition, and it brought together a number of other um, kind of definitions around coercion and, and forced labour that had existed previously but weren't really very cohesive. So it's, it's created a more cohesive act. Obviously there are still debates around it. I'm, I'm not a lawyer, I can't kind yeah. of go into them in depth. There are debates about the wording and, and the interpretation and that is still being worked through. But I mean, I think many police forces think it's helpful to have the Modern Slavery Act in place to describe this crime. But prosecutions under the Modern Slavery Act are still actually quite complex, quite difficult. And in many cases, what local agencies and local forces are opting to do is to try and disrupt patterns of crime as much as um, go through very detailed and complex investigations that you need to secure a modern slavery conviction. Yeah. So, for instance, around sexual exploitation sometimes or... Or, for instance, around some of the exploitation that might be occurring in car washes or that you might be picking up through houses of multiple occupation. The way that they're choosing to disrupt it is to go in with a multi-agency approach and they take in pollution control and they take in environmental health and they take in trading standards and they take in the fire service and they get them on something. Yeah. And it's the Al Capone strategy, down, right? Yeah. Yeah. Very you get Al Capone on tax evasion, not on murder, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so it is about, in many cases, a lot of local areas are bringing in tactics of disruption as well as threat enforcement. Wonderful. Well, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us today. Um, I guess my final question for you is you've outlined the scale of the problem. You seem relatively optimistic about the challenge of making Nottingham slavery free. How do you really feel? Can we do it? By 2030, I'm not sure, but I believe it is possible to shift people's mindset so that accepting goods and services produced in this way will become unacceptable. And I think that could be a process of education which takes a bit longer, but I, I think it is ultimately possible, yeah. That's great. Alison Gardner, thank you very much for being on this episode of The Rights Track. Thank you very much. This episode of The Rights Track was presented by Todd Lamman and produced by Christine Garrington of Research Podcasts. Series 3 of The Rights Track is funded by The Rights Lab, a University of Nottingham programme of research which is helping to end modern slavery. You can find out more in our episode show notes and please subscribe to the podcast for future episodes as we find out more about the work being done to achieve that aim.